invite you to open your Bibles to Luke chapter 24. I know some of you have your Bibles on your tablets or on your phones, whatever device you have, you can look to Luke chapter 24. And we're going to be looking particularly at verses uh, 13 to 36 today. The story that we're looking at is, is commonly known as the uh, road to a man from a Swiss artist. This very famous painting uh, by Robert Zund is called The Road to Emmaus. And this painting looks remarkably similar to the uh, geography around uh, Lausanne and Lucerne where this artist lived. If you've been to Israel, it doesn't quite look like those big trees and you know, kind of lush areas and so on. Maybe some parts of Israel look like this, but the road to, Ma- to Emmaus would have been something a little bit different than that. Just putting it in, into context, where were these two going? We're told in uh, verses 13 and 14, now that same day, two of them are going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. So putting this into context here in Halifax, this is like going for a walk today from here down to Point Pleasant Park. Or if you want to go to the other direction, it's like taking a walk from here to Lower Sackville. These two disciples were processing what was going on, all that was taking place, and Luke puts this story solidly on Easter Sunday morning. So we could be transported back in time to, uh, to a week ago on, 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 on in Easter Sunday. And they're talking to each other as they're making that walk. So think about what it would have been like for, for us, for you today, to start on that walk down to Point Pleasant Park. Where is Jesus? What is happening in our situation right now? They were talking to each other. And they have this remarkable encounter in verse 15 says, As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them. But they were kept from recognizing him. It's a peculiar story in many ways because we have the situation where Jesus is having this conversation with these followers and they don't really recognize him at this point. We know from other gospel stories there's things where when Jesus appeared to them, it looked like his appearance had changed in some way. But I want to use this story as a springboard for us to say, as people of faith, how do we approach our lives? How do we live in the situations and the circumstances that we find ourselves in today as people of faith? I think there's many things that we can learn from the experience of these two we're told in one verse a little bit later on one of the people was called Cleopas and perhaps he was wandering with his wife that day or maybe it was another disciple we're not really sure if you can bring up that photo again that painting Prashant you could see the artist I think did a good job at making the third character in this kind of little indistinguishable whether it was a, a man or a woman who was walking along with them But here are some of the lessons I think we can learn from this story about what it means to be a person of faith and what it means to be walking with the resurrection. First is is this. Our pain can lead to growth. None of us want to go through difficulties. None of us want to go through, through hardships. But the pain that we experience helps us go deeper in our walk with Christ. It helps us go deeper in our walk with God. It helps us learn things uh, about ourselves. Many of us uh, want to reject any sense of pain. We don't want to experience any pain at all. You have an appointment at the dentist for a root canal, and you kind of dread it all the way through, and you say, bring on the lidocaine. I don't want to have any of that experience at all. Some of us try to ignore our pain. Sort of like, if if I don't think about it, If I don't consider it, it's not going to affect me. I'll tell you, I know from counseling a lot of people, that is rarely effective. Because when you ignore your pain for a long period of time, your body has a way of saying, hey, you got to pay attention to what's going on here. Some of us resent our pain. We We are so struck, we are dealing with such a deep struggle that we resent that God has allowed this hardship or this difficulty to come into your circumstance, into your own lives. 
So whether that's the pains that have happened there in these days. In other words, have you been under a rock somewhere that you don't understand what's taking place? This dramatic, big, remarkable thing that's impacted our lives. How can you miss it? How can you miss it? And Jesus was, it says in the next verse, verse 19, what things? Sometimes our sorrow, our disappointment, and our confusion just overwhelms us and makes it impossible for us to see the miraculous thing that is happening right here, right now. The, rema- the, re- the miraculous thing that God is present right in the situation uh, that you're facing. Some people take uh, the, the verses 19 to 24, and, and they say this is the gospel according to Cleopas. The gospel according to Cleopas and, and his partners. So when Jesus asked what things, these verses are going to come up on on the screen, they replied, about Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it's the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but didn't find his body. They came and told us they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the woman had said, but they did not see Jesus. Do you hear in the words that we just read? The sorrow, the, the, the disappointment, the bewilderment, and the confusion. Where is God in this situation that they're facing right now? You know, just a week, two weeks ago, when we celebrated Palm Sunday, they entered into Jerusalem waving, you know, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And then they face this loss and they say, where is God right now? As I think through my own journey of faith, there's been times like that where I'm wondering, where is God in this situation? Where is God in this ongoing struggle that I'm having that just keeps going on and on in my life? You know, where is God in this crisis uh, that I'm facing at this moment in this situation? Our pain is in many ways a gift to us because it undercuts our thoughts that we could do it on our own and it makes us look up and say to God, where are you? I need you right now. Sometimes our rugged individualism, our own independence kind of lulls us into a stupor where we, could, where we think we could do it on our own and pain is a reminder, a blessed reminder to know that God wants to do something deeper with us what happens Jesus listens to these words that they're saying and his response to them in the NIV is kind of harsh he says how foolish you are and I thought oh that's kind of hard hard thing for Jesus to say Uh, maybe it might have been better to say how dull you are or how slow you are None of those kind of fit either, right? Those are none of the things that we want to to hear ourselves. But look at how Peterson says it in Luke 24, 25, and 27. Then he said to them, so thick-headed, so slow-hearted, why can't you simply believe all that the prophets have said? Don't you see that these things had to happen, that the Messiah had to suffer, and only then enter into his glory. Then he started from the beginning with the books of Moses and went through all the prophets, pointing out everything in the, script, that the, scriptures, uh, the, in the scriptures that referred to him. So Cleopas, the gospel according to, to Cleopas, he says, we got all excited about Jesus and it didn't work out. You know, our, our religious leaders had him killed and he's gone. They said, we, the, the women went to the tomb, the tomb was empty, but we don't see Jesus. And they're filled with sorrow and, and disappointment. 
But Jesus, in these words, takes them back to the scriptures and he encourages them to look and see what they taught about him. The encouragement we have here is not only that our pain can lead to growth, but it is an encouragement in here to reflect on God's big story. Jesus opens the scriptures to them and he starts teaching them and points out, look at these prophecies and things that were you kind of talked about in the Old Testament and see how they're being kind of fulfilled in me. You know, we, uh, on Palm Sunday, we remember Jesus kind of going in with his disciples and he celebrated the Passover in Jerusalem this, that, that week just before Easter. And the, the significance of the Passover is the, the children of Israel remembered when they were freed from oppression and difficulty and sorrow in Egypt and they were brought into the promised land. And that is very much a picture of what Jesus has, has done for us as well. And that's why we here at Grace Chapel, we preach both from the New Testament and the Old Testament because we want pe the people of God to understand God's big story. My sister who lives in Calgary, my sister who probably watching this sermon had a special birthday this past week, and uh, she told me about a church that was started up in Calgary that's a New Testament church that they don't consider the Old Testament at all. That's a common heresy that's been a part of church history for a long time. And cutting off the roots of the Old Testament in terms of the mission and the, the, the work of Jesus Christ leaves something that will not stand. That's why here at Grace Chapel, we preach from the book of Jonah and the book of Revelation. We preach from the book of Daniel and we preach through the Psalms. We use the Gospels as a tradition each year. You know, this year we've just gone through Luke and we're finishing off today. And we use the minor prophets as well. Because we want to reflect on God's big story. And God's big story is a story of incredible love and reaching out to people like you and like me. And so he, he shares this story with them. And he starts talking about looking at through the scriptures how these things have all pointed to himself. And it's interesting they still don't see Jesus talking with him. They still don't see how God fits into, into their situation. And then something takes place. Look at verses 30 and 31. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened and they recognized him, and he disappeared from their sight. Again, what a kind of a shocking kind of experience, right? Uh, they, they're, they're talking to this guy for, for quite a while. It's getting dark. They're, they're thinking about stopping. He pretends. He kind of says, I'm going to carry on. And they say in typical Middle Eastern hospitality, no, come in and eat with us. Uh, come in and spend some more time with us. We're enjoying what we're hearing from you. And when he breaks the bread, their eyes were open. They see who he is. Poof, he's gone. Like, what a funny, peculiar thing that is, right? But what was it that made them recognize Jesus w w when he broke uh, the bread? Is it, a, is it a communion experience? You know, each Sunday morning we celebrate communion here at Grace Chapel. We encourage you to come out and participate in that. And, and I think that would be a stretch from what this passage is talking about. I, I think this passage here in Luke 24 harkens back to a story that happened when Jesus and his disciples were interacting with a whole big crowd of people. We're not sure how many people were in that crowd, but we're told there were 5,000 men there. And so you throw in the women and the children. It was a big crowd. And as Jesus was interacting with, uh, with his disciples, they came to him, they, they said a really good, godly thing. There's too many people here. Send them away. Imagine that here at Grace Chapel. We've got too many people. We can't let them in. Send them off. Uh, no, Jesus says, uh, you give them something to eat. And they said, we have nothing. We have five loaves and two fishes. And then Jesus does this miracle. Look at the verse uh, 9, 
verses 16 and 17, Luke 9. Taking the five loaves and two fish and looking up to heaven, he gave thanks and he broke them. Then he gave them to the disciples to distribute to the people. They all ate and were satisfied and the disciples picked up 12 basketfuls of broken pieces that were left over. I, I wouldn't be at all surprised of Cleopas and his partner if they were a part of that 5,000. If they were there that day hearing something about Jesus who heals people, who touches people's lives and brings change, who does these miracles, who has a great teaching uh, ability, uh, and all of a sudden they remember when he breaks the bread. That's him. And I want us to think from this story as an encouragement for us in the situations that we are facing. Keep watching and listening for Jesus. How does walking in the resurrection, walking with the resurrection, show up in your situation? How, how does Jesus share his love for you in the midst of the difficulties and the situations you're going in? You know, sometimes we are all action, right? We're go, go, go. But when your health fails and you end up in a hospital bed, it's time for you to do this work, right? Sometimes we're all go, go and all action. And then when the, the jail cell is locked and you're spending a night by yourself or sharing a cell with another person, it's time for you to do that work again. And the way Jesus speaks to me, keep watching and listening for Jesus, is often in the kindness and the words of, of, of other people. Sometimes it could be like a, like a sense that this is what God wants me to do, but more often than not, it's God's people that he uses to bring an encouragement, a touch, a call, a card, uh, 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 just an interaction that reminds us of the voice of Jesus. That, that's why worship, coming in to worship on a regular basis, helps attune us, helps get us in a place where we can listen to, to what God is saying to us. And the beautiful thing from this story is that Jesus does show up in our situations. In fact, he's right there in the hard, hard moments and the hard, hard times. And sometimes we need to simply stop and ask, Lord, give me spiritual eyes to see and spiritual ears to hear what you are saying uh, to me today. Walking with the resurrection, our pain can lead to growth. We're encouraged to reflect on God's big story. We're encouraged to keep watching and listening for Jesus. And then I had this last point. But we need to share your encounter with Jesus. And I thought about that all night long last night, and I said, no, I said that wrong. You need to share your Jesus encounter. But no, no, a second. No, the first one is right as well. Share your encounter with Jesus and share your Jesus encounter. For those of you for whom English is a second, third, fourth, or fifth language, you might be wondering what I'm saying here, so let me try to explain it. Uh, we are to share our experience that we have with Jesus with other people. But there's truth in what I have up on the screen as well. You could bring to the Lord whatever difficulty you are experiencing. The loneliness of being on your own. The struggle of having an, uh, having an addiction. The ongoing tension of dealing with a mental health problem that's a reoccurrent thing in your life. These are all things that you could bring uh, to, to Christ, and Christ wants to enter in, and Christ is there, present with you right now. But we could also share this Jesus encounter with other people who need to hear uh, about that. We're told in this passage, Luke 24, verse 32, Cleopas and his partner ask each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us. You know, something was happening in my life when I heard about this message of Jesus. 
There's the story of John Wesley, the founder of the Methodist movement, you know, Methodism and so on. And he talked about his heart being strangely warmed when he heard the, the introduction to the book of Romans being read to him. God touched his life. And, and many of us here can remember times when God has touched our lives in the past. But I want to remind you today that the Lord wants to touch your heart right now with whatever you're going through, whatever you're experiencing, uh, the Lord wants to touch your heart. Look at these next two verses. I put them together on the screen. Luke 24, 15 and 16, and Luke 24, verse 36. And I have highlighted it here on the screen in bold, highlighted in your handout, your sermon handout, and in bold and yellow on the screen, the important words, Jesus himself. This morning in the service, we sang a beautiful song, a beautiful Canadian song suggested by Brother David, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. And, and, and that's the, the message of hope I want you to have here. As they walked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them, but they were kept from recognizing him. And then verse 36, while they were still talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, peace be with you. Cleopas and his partner had made it all the way to Point Pleasant Park or Lower Sackville, and they realized they needed to turn around and bring this good news to the other disciples. And when they met to the other disciples, they told them they were listening because they were all excited because not just the women had this kind of encounter with Jesus and saw the empty tomb. Now Simon had, had an encounter with Jesus and they were saying, he's alive. And this gave them hope. But the last words I want you to hold on to and let it sink in. What does it mean to be walking with the resurrection? Peace be.